The Otherness of God. This is part six. We're going to talk about simplicity, the attribute of God called simplicity. We've been going over the attributes of God that make him fully other than us, the incommunicable attributes that only belong to him. These are the ones he doesn't communicate to us. These are what set him apart from us. So far, we've looked at his aseity, his immutability, his eternity, and his omnipresence. Today, we're going to look at his simplicity. But let me start by reading a verse that we'll come back to later. Romans eleven thirty six 36 says, From him, for from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. The simplicity of God. This one, this attribute, this one might not sound right when you hear it said out loud. If I were to take a survey right now and ask the question, of all of you, is God simple or complex? I'm guessing that many of you would answer complex. When we're coming up, when we're coming up with words to describe our great and majestic God of the universe, most of us probably wouldn't use the word simple. One of the classes I teach at Knox Academy, that's the classical Christian school our kids go to, Uh, is a logic class. This past year, we went over informal fallacies. That that It's actually a pretty fun class. I think that the teenagers like it because teenagers like to argue. So, So they would naturally be interested in how to argue better. In fact, I spent the last day uh, telling them how important it was to not use this as a weapon against their friends and parents. I was teaching them how to identify and keep from using bad arguments. These are all kinds of fallacious, there's all kinds of fallacious arguments. I think we went over 30 or 40 of them in the whole school year. One popular one that you probably have heard of, the informal fallacy, is called the ad hominem abusive fallacy. Ad hominem means to the man in Latin. And these are arguments that attempt to avoid the issue by insulting the opponent with abusive language. So it's a distraction. It's a a way to to get away from arguing and just attacking the person. You're wrong because you're ugly, right? That's that kind of thing. And your mama dresses you funny. You attack the person instead of the argument. The two fallacies that relate to our topic for today are the fallacies of composition and division. So first of all, let me just explain what those two are. The first is the fallacy of composition. This was Noah's favorite fallacy. (laughs) Uh, These are are arguments based on the hidden assumption that the properties of the whole will be the same as the properties of the part. It's a fallacy that assumes something, it assumes something true of the parts must be true of the whole. It's also called the part to whole fallacy, W-H-O-L-E, right? So some examples, trees are made up of atoms. Atoms are colorless. Therefore, trees are colorless. You go from the parts to the whole. Uh, The feather is light. That feather pillow must be light, too. That's like the old, you know, trick question when you're a kid. What's what's heavier, a, a, a ton of bricks or a ton of feathers? Here's another one. Each brick in the building weighs less than a pound. Therefore, the building must weigh less than a pound. You go from the part, and you assume that it's true of the whole. No, that's a fallacy. That's bad reasoning. Uh, Lawyers benefit from making $100 an hour. We should raise the minimum wage so we all can benefit from making $100 an hour. And everybody said, no. Don't be a bunch of socialists. Just because something's true of the part doesn't mean it's true of the whole. And then the other one is kind of the opposite. It's the fallacy of division. This It's a very, very similar, but the opposite. Arguments that are based on the hidden assumption that a collective whole determines that all the parts will be like the whole. It's a fallacy that assumes something true of the whole must be true of the parts. It's also called the whole to parts fallacy. Some examples of that, and this is the, the, the saying it backwards, the same one I just used about the pillow. This feather pillow is pretty heavy. Each feather must be pretty heavy, too. 
Here's another one. Cows are basically grass-eating machines, so a nice, thick tri-tip should be able to digest grass as well. One more. This yummy chocolate cake has butter in it. If I eat a stick of butter, it will taste just as yummy. Just because something is true of the whole doesn't necessarily mean it's true of the parts. So this brings us back to divine simplicity, the simplicity of God. The oldest of the doctrinal standards of the Reformed churches, the Belgic Confession in 1561, begins like this. This is Article 1 of the Belgic Confession, uh, titled The Only God. It's, it begins with these words. We all believe in our hearts and confess with our mouths that there is a single and simple spiritual being whom we call God, eternal, incomprehensible, invisible, unchangeable, infinite, almighty, completely wise, just, and good, and the overflowing source of all good. But listen to that first phrase. We confess, we believe in our hearts and confess with our mouths that there is a single, we, we get that, God is one, uh, a single and a simple spiritual being. There's that word, simple. It's the, the, the first thing they say about God, single and simple. One of the reasons why we have lost sight or forgotten about this doctrine or this attribute of God is our modern understanding of the word simple. We think of simple as maybe easy to understand, right? It's Make it simple. Or we have that, the old acronym, keep it simple, stupid, right? KISS. Or we might think of uh, simplistic or a simpleton or someone who is simple-minded. Those are all negative. So why would we talk about the simplicity of God? This is obviously not what we're talking about when we talk about the simplicity of God. Kevin DeYoung explains it uh, this way. He says, the, the simplicity of God is an important truth few Christians think about anymore. By simple, we do not mean God is slow or dim-witted, nor do we mean that God is easy to understand. Simple as a divine attribute is the opposite of compound. The simplicity of God means God is not made up of his attributes. He does not consist of goodness, mercy, justice, and power. He is goodness, mercy, justice, and power. Every attribute of God is identical with his essence. That's the young. This is going to be kind of philosophical today, so bear with me. But I love this. This is just, I, I, I hope this just brings us in more awe of our mighty God. I'll give you a simple definition of the simplicity of God or divine simplicity by Matthew Barrett. He says, simplicity means God is not made up of parts. He's not composite or a compounded being. He is simple. All that is in God is God. God is not made up of parts. So when we use the word simple for God, we're using the word in the now less common sense of not complex or not composed of parts. That's what we mean by uh, simple when we talk about God. God is without parts. The being of God is identical to the attributes of God. Barrett goes on to say, God is not made up of parts, nor is he compounded or composite composite in nature. That means he does not possess attributes as if his attributes are one thing and his essence another. Rather, his essence is his attributes and his attributes his essence. God is his attributes. That means all that is in God simply is God. Simplicity is key for it distinguishes between the infinite, eternal, and immutable creator and the finite, temporal, and mutable creature. That's Barrett. So he's telling us that one of the reasons this doctrine of simplicity is critical, it's key, is because it highlights the creator-creature distinction. Remember, we're talking about the otherness of God, his incommunic incommunicable attributes, that which transcends us. The perfections and attributes of God are not like a pizza. If we were to slice up a pizza into different, you know, many pieces, pe no, not pizzas, pieces, pieces of pizza. 
omnipresence is 15 percent love is 20 percent holiness 25 you know and so on we, it's not that's not what his attributes are there's there's that old uh stand-up comedian who talked about the pizza when he was saying when everybody's eating pizza and they're almost running out and he's like doing the pizza math he called it well oh, she already had two pieces you better not take the last one so that's that's not what this is like God, god's attributes are not all different parts of god god being evenly divided among us among his various attributes and like the pizza he doesn't have some attributes that are greater than others so as christians can't argue about which ones are more important because that's what usually happens what maybe uh, his justice is more important. Maybe uh, most people would say his love is the more important attribute. James uh, Dolezal, uh, I think that's how you say his name. I got a lot of this stuff from him, his book. He says this, It is because God is simple, not composed of parts, that God is, in fact, absolutely irreducible in being, and thus the most fundamental reality upon which all else depends. When we talk about divine simplicity, we're talking about divine irreducibility, that God is not an entity that depends upon or is founded on realities more basic and fundamental or absolute than himself. This is the one of the things that separates our God from the idols of the other false religions. Idols are constructed. They're built. They're constructed by composers. Our God has no composers, no components. Our God is just I am. He's I am. The doctrine of simplicity is a, a, it's a, a studied denial of composition and parthood that would make God a dependent deity, an idol, a false god. He wouldn't be worthy of our worship. We worship the one who is the reason for all things, but has no reason for himself that isn't himself. I, I want to clear up one more a uh, wrong way of, of thinking of the simplicity of God, we also don't mean by simplicity that God somehow lacks power, right? That's not what we're talking about, that God somehow, if it's simple, he lacks power. In our modern way of thinking, we're, we're used to thinking of multi-parted things as more effective at operating and getting things done, right? We, we just, that's how we see it. That's how it is. So if God is the ultimate operator, the one who created and sustains all things, wouldn't he need to be not simple, but the most super complex thing in the world, in the universe? I also teach uh, at the same school a science class. Uh, and one of the things we did as a science project is I, I made a rocket out of a water bottle, some pencils, tape, Baking soda, baking soda, soda, and vinegar. And it was a, another one of those duds of an experiment. It was supposed to work. It was supposed to go like 10 or 20 feet in the air, but it only went about one or two feet. It was pretty, uh, it was one of those womp, womp, womp. But if you were to compare my rocket made out of a smart water bottle, to Elon Musk's SpaceX rockets, right? There'd probably be a contrast there. You'd probably see quite a contrast. They're both rockets made of parts, and both were made to go up, but one is much more complex and efficient and powerful than the other. My rocket went one or two feet in the air. Elon's goes about 360 miles in the air. It wouldn't be a stretch to think that a big part of the reason why his rocket works so much better than mine, not just because I designed mine, but because his has more parts. It's more complex. It's that multiplicity of parts that enables his rocket to do so much more, to go so much further, to be so much more powerful. So it's no surprise that we think that the more multi-part a thing is, the more it can do and the more powerful it can be. So we use this kind of thinking to conclude that if God is going to create and sustain a universe, wouldn't he need to be a super multi-parted being? That's, and that's not bad reasoning if we're talking about 
finite causes. If we're talking about finite causes, as a rocket is a finite cause, a machine that has limitations, and my pathetic rocket was extremely limited, limited. Finite causes are necessarily built of parts, and the reason we can't say this about God is because everything made of parts requires a maker. It requires someone to put those parts together, a composer. When we look at the SpaceX rockets, we assume there was an assembler or a giant well-paid team of assemblers. When you look at my rocket, you assume that I made it. And then you roll your eyes. Multi-parted entities depend on two things. Multi-parted entities depend on two things. First, upon the parts of which they are composed. Second, upon whatever agent composes the parts. They may be causes that can do great things, but they are dependent on their parts and their unifier of parts, you could say. James Dolezal, again, put it this way. He says, the principal claim of divine simplicity is that God is not composed of parts. Whenever, or whatever is composed of parts depends upon its parts in order to be as it is. A part is anything in a subject that is less than the whole and without which the subject would be really different than it is. In short, composite beings need their parts in order to exist as they do. Moreover, the parts in an integrated whole require a composer distinct from themselves to unify them, an intrinsic source of unity. If God should be composed of parts, of components that were prior to him in being, he would be doubly dependent. He would be doubly dependent, first on the parts, and second on the composer of the parts. But God is absolute in his being, in being, alone the sufficient reason for himself and all other things, and so cannot in any respect derive his being from another. Because God cannot depend on what is not God in order to be God, theologians traditionally insist that consists that all that is in God is God. We can't say that the absolute creator and sustainer of the universe, uh, that someone supplied unity of being to him, someone supplied the unity of being that put him together. Remember the Shema in Deuteronomy 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Yahweh, our God, Yahweh is one. God's oneness, his unity of being, was not something that was imposed upon him by some unifier. He is one. He said, I am that I am. I like how uh, A.W. Tozer put it. He said, God exists in himself and of himself. His being owes to no one. His substance is indivisible. He has no parts, but is single in his unitary being. The doctrine of the divine unity means not only that there is but one God, it means also that God is simple, uncomplex, not made of parts, one with himself. The harmony of his being is the result not of a perfect balance of parts, but of the very absence of parts. Between his attributes, no contradiction can exist. He need not suspend one to exercise another, for in him all his attributes are one. All of God does all that God does. He does not divide himself to, to perform a work, but works in the total unity of his being. That's Tozer. 1 Corinthians 8, 4 through 6 says, Therefore, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no real existence and that there is no God but one. For although there may be so-called gods in heaven and on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, whom, for, from whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. It's the oneness of God. James 2, 18 says, But someone will say, You have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one. You believe that God is one. You do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. 
Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is dead? God is one. He's unity. He's absolute. And he always is. We talked about the eternity of God. Romans 11, 33 and 36 says, Oh, the depths, oh, the depth of the riches and the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments, how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has been his counselor, or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. <clears throat> The doctrine of divine simplicity means that God is not composed of parts. The reason we say this is that because whatever is composed of parts is dependent upon its parts to be what it is. God does not depend upon parts, and God does not depend on a composer of parts. Well, we already saw this when, when we looked at his aseity. <clears throat> God is self-existent, self-sufficient. God is never in need of anything outside of himself. He doesn't even need us. We were shocked to find that out, right? He doesn't need us. We need him. All that God does toward us, he does toward uh, because of, of what we need, not because he needs. He's never forced into anything by anyone or anything outside of himself. If God were composed of parts, he would be both dependent on the parts themselves and whatever put them together both the parts and whatever put those parts together or supply the unity of those parts. The medieval, uh, the theologian Thomas Aquinas put it like this. He said, every, compo every composite is posterior, meaning it follows after, uh, to its components, since the simpler exists in itself before anything is added to it from the composition of a third. But nothing is prior to the first. Therefore, since God is the first principle, which he means the one from whom are all things. God is, since he's the first principle, the source of all things, he's not composite. That's Aquinas. While Aquinas uses the word composite and composition to explain what God is not, the church father Irenaeus uses the word compound to explain what God is not. If something is compounded, it means it has more than one part to it, each part being separate. Uh, from the other. And by contrast, God being simple is an uncompounded being, he says, not having different members. He's totally equal to himself. So it's probably more appropriate than to put the word holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y, holy in front of each of his attributes to emphasize this point. God is not as men are, explains Arrhenius, for the father of all is a vast distance from those affections and passions which operate among men. He is a simple, uncompounded being, without diverse members, and altogether like and equal to himself, since he is holy understanding, and holy spirit, and holy thought, and holy intelligence, and holy reason. It's W-H-O-L-L-Y, holy, complete. Holy light, and the whole source of all that is good. So here's the question for you. Does God depend... Does he depend in any way on what is not God in order to exist or be or do as he is and does? Is he dependent? Or to put it another way, does God depend on what is not God to be God? Does God depend on what is not God to be God? This is what the doctrine of simplicity answers. If, if you say no to that question, then you already believe in the simplicity of God. God does not require or depend on what is not himself in order to be himself or in order to do anything that he does. In other words, a seity or his uh, self-existence implies simplicity. Now, this is great. This is a prayer of Anselm uh, of Canterbury. He said this is a prayer he wrote, and it's all about this. He says this. What are you, Lord? What are you? What shall my heart understand you to be. You are assuredly life. You are wisdom. You are truth. You are goodness. You are blessedness. You are eternity. And you are every true good. These are many things, and my limited understanding cannot see them all in one single glance so as to, as to delight in all at once. How then, Lord, are you all these things? 
Are they parts of you? Or rather, is each one of these wholly what you are? For whatever is made up of parts is not absolutely one, but in a sense, many and other than itself. And it can be broken up either actually or by the mind, all of which things are foreign to you. I'm guessing most of you probably never prayed a prayer like this before. He continues. Therefore, there are no parts in you, Lord. Neither are you many, but you are so much one and the same with yourself that in nothing you are dissimilar with yourself. Indeed, you are unity itself, not divisible by any mind. Life and wisdom and the other attributes then are not parts of you, but are one and each one of them is wholly what you are and what all the others are. Since then, neither you nor your eternity, which you are, have parts. No part of you of your eternity is anywhere or at any time, but you exist as a whole everywhere, and your eternity exists as a whole always. That's the prayer of Anselm. Again, de Young puts it this way: the simplicity of God is not only not only prevents us from making or from ranking certain attributes higher than others, it allows God to have a distinct and infinite life of his own within himself. He's not an abstract, absolute idea who happens to have love, wisdom, and holiness. As if we first conceive of being of a being called God and then relate qualities to him. <clears throat> Rather, God is his very essence. Lost my place. He is his very essence. Still looking for where I was. That's weird. Oh, there it is. <laughs> God is his very essence within himself and by himself is love, wisdom, and holiness. God is whatever he has. He is whatever he has. He is not the composite of his attributes, some in greater and some in lesser amounts. God is a simple being without parts or pieces. His attributes do not stick to him. He is what they are. Uh, the church father, Augustine, appealed to liquid, the human body, and sunshine to make this point. The nature of the Trinity is called simple because it cannot lose any attribute it possesses and because there is no difference between what it is and what it has. And there is, for example, between, as there is, for example, between a vessel or a cup and the liquid in it, the liquid it contains, a body and its color, the atmosphere and its light or heat, the soul and its wisdom. Augustine concludes, none None of these is what it contains. None of these is what it contains. A cup and liquid, you guys still with me? <laughs> a cup and liquid, a body and its color, the atmosphere and its light or heat, the soul and its wisdom. What do all these have in common? The answer, division, division. This is not how it is with God and his attributes. He's one. All his attributes are equally ultimate. Uh, as Matthew Barrett explains, God's attributes are not external to his essence as if they added a quality to him that he would not otherwise possess. It's not as if there were attributes that were accidental to God, capable of being added or subtracted, lost and then found, as if they did not even have to exist in the first place. Rather, God is his attributes. Instead of addition and division, there's absolute unity. His essence is is his attributes, and his attributes his essence. Or as Augustine says, God has no properties, but it is pure essence. They neither differ from his essence, nor do they differ materially from each other. Again, I love what Anselm said in his prayer I just read to you. For whatever is made up of parts is not absolutely one. Whenever there's plurality of parts, that which is made up of those parts is susceptible to being dissolved. But in contrast, God is unity itself. He is unity itself, not divisible. So when we talk about the attributes of God, both his communicable and incommunicable attributes, we're not talking about what he has, right? That's important to understand. We're not talking about what he has, but what he is. These are what he is. And each of his attributes are equal, equally ultimate. God doesn't have wisdom. He is wisdom. By, 
He is the wisdom by which he is wise. He doesn't have love. He is the love by which he is loving. He doesn't have power. He is the power by which he is all-powerful. Stephen Charnock, in his book on the existence and attributes of God, says this, God is the most simple being. For that which is first in nature, having nothing beyond it, cannot by any means be thought to be compounded, for whatsoever is so, is compounded, depends upon the parts whereof it is compounded, and so is not the first being. Now God, being infinitely simple, hath nothing in himself which is not himself. God, being infinitely simple, hath nothing in himself which is not himself, and therefore can cannot will any change in himself, he being his own essence and existence. That's Charnock. Again, scriptures that show God's uh, aseity, his independence, his self-existence, also show his simplicity. <clears throat> uh, Romans 11, again, the, uh, for from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Acts 17, 24, the God who made the world and everything in it, be, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. The Greek word there where it says, nor is he served by human hands. The word served is therapuo, where we get the word therapy. Right? Therapy conveys good to a patient. Nobody is God's therapist, right? working to improve and make his life better. God has no therapist that bestows some goodness to him. He's not a receiver of goodness. He's goodness itself. He's the giver of it, not the receiver of it. Again, Dolezal put it well. He said, if God possesses his existence, essence, and or attributes as so many determinations of being, which they would be if they were in him as distinct parts and constituents, then in fact he is indebted to that which is not God for the fullness of his being. As for our trust in him, if God is composed of parts, which as parts must necessarily be distinct from the fullness of God's being as God, then our confidence in him must look to some source of being prior to him, a reality more fundamental than himself. This is what divine aseity and independence prescribes. Thus, all that is in God must be God. Earlier theologians liked the imagery of light, light passing through a prism. Pure white light is not perceptible to the eye. It needs to be refracted into a spectrum of color in order to be seen by us. We can think of the attributes of God in this way. And I got this from Dolezal as well. He said, he, 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 causes, he causes the infinite plenitude of simple glory to pass through the prism of creation and redemption and refract, as it were, into a spectrum of glorious attributes. So one beam might be immutability, and another omnipotence, and another goodness, and another justice. The multiplicity of those terms and those attributes is due to the refracted manner in which God manifests himself in our lives, and in scripture, and in nature. But just as it just as with the spectrum, you wouldn't trace the spectrum back to a spectrum behind it. The spectrum traces back to pure white light. All that is contained in the rainbow of color is pure white light, just not spectrally. When we talk about God and his attributes, we're beholding the beams of spectral glory that he has shown forth in the created order and in scripture. But we need to know that those are not parts of God. Those are not parts of God. God is most absolute, irreducible in being, the one from whom, from whom, through whom, and to whom are all things. This is why we don't look for a being prior to him and worship that. We can worship him with absolute and unreserved faith. We can trust completely, trust him completely, because he's not a relative being dependent on what is not himself to be himself. So again, the application for today is just behold thy God. Now to the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, to God who alone is wise, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Please stand. Let's pray together.
Our Father and everything, we give you thanks for we know that this is your will for us in Christ Jesus. We thank you for him, for your provision for our earthly needs, for the sacred rest of the Lord's day, for the privilege of returning a portion of our blessing to you in tithes and offerings, and for making us your partners and taking the gospel of the Lord Jesus to the very ends of the earth. Thank you, Father, for all these things. Amen.